All right, so anytime you have to test code that relies on APIs, databases, caches, or anything else that has to go out onto the network, it makes testing pretty hard. It's easy to test code that just relies on simple stuff like you know, pure code, pure functions, pure anything, pure anything really is pretty easy to test. But as soon as we get into IO and things like that, testing is pretty challenging. So in this video, we're going to talk about what makes this so hard, where I think a lot of developers are struggling, and how to develop a testing strategy that enables you to test this stuff. So maybe the first question to answer is, what is infrastructure? Well, infrastructure is, at least in terms of application development, infrastructure is the stuff that our application runs on. It is the web server, it's the database, it's the cache. This is what powers the application itself. We need this stuff because if we don't have it, then we can't actually connect our application to the real world. So what this means is that we're going to have to use numerous different methods of testing, not just one. So where I think a lot of people get stuck in testing is we fail to do this technique of separating core code from infrastructure code. Core code is code that is pure, and this is very much the heart of your application. This is the family jewels. This is your business logic, your validation logic, and the stuff that makes your application valuable in a sense. Infrastructure code is everything else we talked about. It's your caching logic, it's your database logic, it's your web server, GraphQL logic, and all of this stuff that makes it possible for someone to actually use this application that you've built. Now, as I said, the, the problem is that developers often don't know how to separate core code from infrastructure code. This means that it's all kind of coupled together. And when your core code is coupled to your infrastructure code, you don't have a lot of testing options. There's only one real kind of way to test your application, and it's through the technique of black box testing. In other words, you could say this is an end-to-end -end test. We can only really test passing through the entire application. We can only kind of test input-output. We don't really have this granularity to be able to craft different edge cases in a clean way. And this is challenging because it also means that our setup code for our tests is a lot more involved. Our tests are slower and it's just, a, it could be very painful to just write your tests in general. So what we want here are testing options. We want a way to test our application core. We want the ability to test the infrastructure that actually connects everything together. And we want a way to test it all end to end to see that it works correctly. Now, before I show you the solution to this, I just want to kind of walk you through an example of what some of this code might look like. In fact, it's uh, very similar to the type of code I was writing before I started my software design journey. So let's just take a quick look at that here. Okay, so what I've got loaded up here is a very simple create user request. We are using Express as a web server. And if you look here, you can see that we're importing create user, that's gonna be controller. And we're hooking it up to a route, which is, there's only one route on this API for now. So now kind of peering into this, we can see that there's a lot of different types of logic all in a controller. And Martin Fowler wrote about this, he calls this the anemic domain model, and you could also say that this is a transaction script, meaning that there's no actual different place in our code that's separate from this that handles the business logic and handles the application logic. Essentially, there's no domain layer, which if you're familiar with the clean architecture is really important. So let's just kind of walk through this. There's some request validation here. We're just checking to see that things are in the request. If not, we're going to send a 400 back. And then if we look down here, you'll see that there's a Firebase user repo. This is a very specific kind of object, but what's interesting here is that there's a form of application logic that's right here in the code. This is where we're checking to make sure that if the user has already registered, we're going to return an application error. And then going down even further, we can see that we have some validation logic, but this validation logic doesn't live anywhere near the entities or the value objects themselves. Instead, it looks like this value object is inside of a service. And as another side note, a quick way for you to see if you have an anemic domain model is to look and see if you have any service classes like this that seem like they are doing logic that has to do more with entities like 
email, password, first name, last name, and they're handling them all instead of being handled on the objects themselves. So there is no email, password, first name, last name object. So it is pretty anemic in that sense. Now we continue a little bit further. If any one of these goes wrong, we're going to send back a 400 error. And then here's where we create the user. There is no real kind of, you know, checking to make sure we have all of the fields. There's no user creation logic. It doesn't look like here. We're just assembling it onto a really basic raw object. And then what we're gonna do is we are going to save it to a database. And if anything goes wrong, we'll send back a 500, if not 201. Now, okay, this code works and there's nothing really wrong with this code functionally, but how would we test that? I, I'm asking you now, how would you test this code? What options are available? If you really think about it, the only option that's available is just a test that passes through everything, as I kind of mentioned before. That's all we have available here. If we wanted to test the validation logic right here, or we wanted to test uh, this application logic, there's no way to do this purely. The only way to do this is to bring a database or and also just bring the entire Express server with us in our testing code. And that means the tests are gonna be pretty slow and that means that they might be kind of a pain to set up and tear down. Now, we want to be able to test a layer of our code, the application code, as fast as possible. We wanna have this running beside us if we're performing TDD. We want to get almost instant feedback that our application is working as intended. And then when we're ready to test the integrations, we want to be able to also test these things separately. So the question now is how can we go about making this a reality? Okay, so in SolidBook, I talk about the notion of architectural patterns. Just like kind of how we have design patterns, which solve problems at the class level, we also have architectural patterns, which solve problems at the architecture level. The challenge is the way we've written our code means we don't have a lot of testing options. And as an industry, we've realized that when you need a lot of testing options, the architectural pattern you wanna to look towards is called a layered architecture. Now a layered architecture also goes by the clean architecture, hexagonal architecture, onion architecture, ports and adapters. They're all kind of the same thing for the most part. It is an architecture where we decompose all of the concerns into layers. We have a domain layer, an application layer, an infrastructure layer, and then often a adapter layer, which describes how your infrastructure can actually hook into and connect to your core code. So what is the primary benefit of this layered architecture of decomposing these layers and decoupling them from each other? Well, the benefit now is we have just decoupled the core code, this is your application core, from the infrastructure. And this means that we now have testing options. So if we want, we could test our core code using unit tests or acceptance tests, and we can write this in a pure way. We could test this code separately from how we test our infrastructure code. So now that we know about a layered architecture and what it gives us, this ability to separate your core code from your infrastructure code, now we wanna develop a testing strategy. So we want to know before we write our first line of code, how are we going to verify that this thing works and how are we going to feel good about the strategy we've chosen? That's kind of what we need to do at the very front. So now I'm gonna flip over to show you some code that relies on a testing strategy where I test the application core, so this is gonna be the application layer and the domain layer using unit tests. This is also referred to as a use case test, which I've written about on my blog. You can take a look at that. I'll leave a link for that. But the idea is we are testing the essential complexity of the application, the, the feature or the vertical slice, if you will, as a unit, an atomic unit of code, and it's completely pure and we can test all of the success cases and the error cases purely, and we could do this really quickly. And then when we're ready later on, we could test the way that the feature integrates with our infrastructure through integration tests and end-to-end -end tests. Okay, so now if we look at what we've got here starting, you'll see there are a couple more files that we're starting with here. As a rule of thumb, I like to practice a technique called BDD, uh, or you could also now, if you look here, you can see that I'm starting with a couple more files. Now we have a feature file 
which is going to describe the behavior of the feature. And as a rule of thumb, I always like to start with trying to elucidate the essential complexity first. We start with describing what needs to happen before we actually go about building it. I believe there should be at least one layer of declarative code always. And that layer is going to be in English, which is the most readable form of declarative code, really, if we think about it. So here we have some scenarios, and I just have two for now. Creating a user, given when then, this is what should happen, and another one for a failure state, if I pass in an invalid password, here's what should happen. So I'll start with that, and if I move over to our test file here, I have a package called just cucumber, which is what actually powers this, this feature file, this given when then gherkins file. And what we could do is we load up the feature and we can write the test code and we can assert that it is correct. And sometimes at, when I'm running these types of tests, these acceptance tests or these use case tests, I like to start from the assert phase from the from what would this look like if it is actually completed. So I'll start here and I know that this will work if I get a result that says create user success. And I also know that it's going to work if I try to save to the database one time. That's also going to tell me that this thing worked correctly. So working backwards, we have that and then we have this use case here. And then we are constructing the preconditions so that we could actually run this scenario. So this is what the test might look like. And we have another one that looks very similar, except I'm passing in an invalid password. Now, if we go over to the use case, now the use case is the, the core functionality. So this, is, this contains all the core functionality without any infrastructure directly referenced in it. It's completely decoupled from infrastructure. Now, how is that possible? Because this relies on a database. It does rely on a database. And you'll see, instead of passing in that Firebase instance directly, it relies on an interface, an abstraction to a database. And this is dependency inversion. That's the, one of the foundational techniques that we're going to use throughout our software design career a lot. So dependency inversion allows us to decouple software components from each other. So that's what we're doing here. Now, our use case is going to take in our input, which is going to look something like this. And we will also notice that it has a way to, has a number of ways it could fail. And I also like to make the implicit explicit. So we have a type that expresses explicitly how this thing will succeed or how it could fail. And we've kind of unioned that all together into one nice object. And we've said that that is going to be the return result. And the signature for this interface is it's going to take an in and it's going to take an out. And that what goes, that's what goes in here. This is what comes out there. All right. So let's just walk through this real quick. See the logic. You'll see we have that checking that the user's registered. If not, we're going to return an error. And our validation logic, which was originally in services, you'll see that now this validation logic lives in objects. And this is a domain-driven design tactical pattern where we make use of something called value objects. If you're not familiar with those, I would also implore you to go check out the blog uh, where you can learn about value objects and more. So we have validation logic and value objects, and we're going to make sure that each and every single one of them is correct. None of them have errors. If any of them have errors, we're going to return an error. And we're going to make sure that that error is very explicit. Then we try to assemble the user entity, which is another tactical pattern from domain-driven design. And we have that user here. And if the user can't be created, then we're going to also return an error. Now, finally, what we do is we save this to a database. And you'll notice, again, this is not referring directly to a Firebase database. With this technique for testing, we could pass in any type of database we want as long as it adheres to the interface of an iUser repo. And if we think back to the solid principles, the technique used there is the Liskov substitution principle. So if this fails, we're going to return an unexpected error. We're not going to print anything out. And then finally, if it succeeds, we're going to do a create user success. 
Now, how does the, so if we just were to run this test, this test would run this use case very quickly. It would, it would do it fast and it wouldn't rely on any infrastructure. So how is that made possible? It's made possible because let's, the only thing we really need to inject is the user database, right? Now, what is that here? So user repo spy, what is that? That's what we're passing in. That's the thing that's being injected. So let's take a look at what that is. So you'll notice here we have a user repo spy, which implements I user repo. And again, thinking back to Liskov substitution, this is going to be valid if we pass this in because all it needs is to have the two methods that are absolutely required for it to be considered an I user repo. It also has this other method where we can do get times, get times save called. So what I find is for testing, it's pretty useful to be able to write your own kind of methods to assert like how was this thing called or how many times was this thing called. If you need to verify that a command was issued against an external API or some other infrastructural adapter, what you can do is you can create a spy object which implements the interface that it relies on, you can give it some alternative logic, and then you can verify that it was called or the way it was called later on. And so this is really focused on testing your application core code. This is not testing your infrastructure adapters though. That needs to be tested separately with integration tests where you actually just specifically test, hey, is this saving to a database correctly? Is this saving in the shape I needed to save? If it's not, then we'll figure that out. And then later on, we test it all with end-to-end -end tests. Okay, cool. So that's pretty much how this thing works. Now, if we go over to create user controller, we can see that all of that request logic where we're sending back status codes and whatnot, it's all being handled within the appropriate place, within a controller, because that's infrastructure logic. That's not application logic and it's not domain logic. So if we wanted to, we could test this specifically, but I think it makes more sense for us to test the way it integrates with our application core. Now, if your application core is really meticulous and it's, let's say you're doing something that's super complex, this is going to be your saving grace because you don't want to have to spin up a database and spin up a web server every single time you want to test some meticulous edge cases in your application core. So this, this form of decoupling is actually really critical. We kind of hook everything together up here. We pass the Firebase repo into the use case and the use case into the controller. So we're composing things together. And then in our app, we just use the controller. And that's pretty much that. So to conclude this video, the big thing I want to say is to test code that relies on APIs or network requests and databases, caches, whatever, is you need to separate core code from infrastructure code. This is only necessary if your testing strategy involves unit tests and use case tests, and you want to have different types of tests instead of just testing everything through a black box, like an end-to-end -end test. All right, so that's it for this video. If you liked it, definitely give me some feedback on it. Like, subscribe, check out the blog, check out SolidBook.io if you're interested in learning how to write flexible, testable, maintainable code. And until then, I will see you in the next video.